Hello and welcome everybody uh, to the Vision 2022 Symposium number two. Symposium number one was so good that we decided to do a sequel. Um, my name's Nick Josefowitz. I'm the Chief of Policy at SPUR, a think tank in the Bay Area. And uh, this is the Zoom that you want to be in if you believe that we can do something about climate change, about climate justice and a just transition about dirty air that is killing Californians and about the wildfires that are devastating our communities. Just some quick logistics. If you have technical issues um, with this Zoom, please email Livesey Pack or Marissa Garcia. That, um, Livesey's, uh, Livesey's email is up there. We can put Marissa's email in the chat. If you have questions for the participants, please put them in the chat box or email them to Jeremy Madsen um, and his email is right there and will also go in the chat box. Um, we're gonna try and um, answer questions but we won't be able to answer all of them. Um, and we're really keen to gather your questions um, and your thinking to help us improve our thinking about this initiative. Um, we'll also be live tweeting at Climate and Clean Air and you can learn more on our website at climateandcleanair.org. So what are we doing here together? We're working to create a major new funding source, possibly a statewide ballot measure for November 2022 to invest in strategies to fight climate change and clean our air. While we expect such a measure to have a term of 20 to 30 years or beyond, for this discussion, we want to focus on the first decade because we have looming deadlines in 2030 and 2031. One. It is vital for our state and our planet that we meet our 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, which put us on track to be carbon neutral by mid-century. Unfortunately, today, we are on track to meet our 2050 emissions targets over a century too late. Two, seven of the 10 cities that have the worst air pollution in the United States are in California. Tens of thousands of Californians are dying every year as a result. This effort would clean our air. Three, this year, California wildfires burned an area greater than the size of LA County, San Francisco County and Sacramento County combined. And we're on December 3rd today, and there are still wildfires burning. No community is immune from fires impacts and addressing wildfires is essential to meeting our climate and air quality goals. And four, this effort must be and will be reparative, lifting up and centering those frontline communities, low income and black and brown communities who have suffered most from pollution and fossil fuels and the extractive economy. And this effort must also fund a just transition for fossil fuel workers. The measure we have in mind will generate about $30 billion over the next decade. And there are a variety of revenue sources that we believe can do that. At our October panel, Symposium One, leaders like Mary Nichols, Fran Pavley, Kevin DeLeon, Terry Tamman, and Senator Nancy Skinner and others spoke about how our priority investments for such a fund over the next decade have to include clean transportation, cleaning our transportation systems, both on-road and off-road, addressing short-lived climate super pollutants, including preventing wildfires that produce black carbon, and lifting up frontline communities most impacted by pollution and centering their well being and economic success, as well as the just transition for fossil fuel workers. Today, in this discussion, we're going to talk about cleaning up transportation. Symposium number three, we're going to focus on short lived climate super pollutants, including wildfires. So today, um, and here I put up a list of our incredibly distinguished and awesome panel, uh, set, set of, uh, set of, set of uh, panelists. Today we're here seeking the advice of, of these experts who come from both the government and the private sector. We want to know why additional revenue is an essential complement to additional regulation, and what are some of the smartest ways to use a significant new um, revenue source like what we're talking about. What will be the smartest investments to reduce both climate and, air quality and, and improve air quality emissions within the transportation sector? 
What are the biggest opportunities and what would be the most significant challenges related to such an effort? How do we design a funding program to complement regulation and accelerate compliance? And how can we hardwire equity and adjust transition into these efforts? We have a lot of speakers, so I'm not gonna go through detailed bios of all of them up front, um, but they're all there on your screen. Um, and uh, we're so excited to have Reginda, Steve, Matt, John, Dawn, Kevin, Todd, Raj, Susanna, and Henry joining us. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'm now gonna hand it over to uh, Denny Zane, um, who's going to do a little bit of context setting for today's discussion. Very good, thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure to be with all of you here today um, on this uh, adventure to try to help uh, address climate change and clean air, clean our air. So one of the things we have to do, I think, is explain that the, the focus on transportation is not just because um, some important leaders like Mary Nichols and Fran Pavley and Kevin DeLeon told us that we should, rather it's rooted in the science. And you can see right here on this chart, um, this graph, that um, our NOx emissions, which are the precursor to smog, ozone, um, is primarily from on-road and off-road mobile sources. That's the yellow and the gray, part of the bar, 74% of the total, and they are dominated by diesel-powered vehicles. So if we're gonna deal with air pollution, we gotta deal with diesel. It's also true that our greenhouse gas emissions are uh, most heavily from transportation sources as well. And this chart shows you that 41% directly from transportation sources, but in fact, in the industrial portion there, there's another share that goes um, from refin refineries. So we put that together, transportation is roughly half of all California's greenhouse gas emissions. So we got to deal with transportation in order to clean our air and in order to deal with climate change. And if we do that, if we do both well, um, we can be very successful. Note here that in the entire United States, um, transportation is a is the largest sector also for the for the entire United States. Again, if the oil industry were added, that transportation uh, is well over a third of all of our greenhouse gases. If we, if we solve transportation, we really go a long way to solving climate change. And now I think uh, I'm, we're gonna bring uh, Rajendra Sohata. Is Rajendra there? Let's see, where are you? I'm there here, you Hi, Rajendra. Hi. So Rajinder is the Chief of Industrial Strategies Division at the California Air Resources Board, and she has a very, very important job. She is the person responsible for helping to develop, leading the effort to develop the scoping plan, the plan that California follows um, in order to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. So welcome, Rajinder. We look forward to hearing from you today. Um, we would really like you to give us your view about the importance of transportation um, in addressing our need for greenhouse gas reductions um, and how SB 32 um, helps to drive and direct that effort. Sure, and thanks Denny and Spur for the invitation to join you all for this conversation. Um, as you showed on those graphs, transportation and the associated fuels production are a huge portion of the greenhouse gases in the state of California. And then you have the NOx and other criteria pollutant impacts. And many of those criteria pollutant impacts are hitting um, low income communities and other majority minority population communities the hardest in the state. Um, and before I move off that point, I want to talk about what led us to this place and why we need to think about transportation together as air quality, as an EJ issue, and as a climate issue. It is policies that have left us in a place where the majority of our frontline communities are located adjacent to or under freeways in the state of California. Policies that took place over the last few decades, everything that resulted in things like redlining. And so there is an imperative that we as government 
come back and think about how we can ameliorate those, those issues that are now present in these communities. We must think about it that way. But then knowing that transportation is uh, over 50% of the emissions in California, our chances of hitting the 2030 target, which is 40% below 1990 levels, or chances of hitting the carbon neutrality targets out to 2045 must be through transportation. If we don't get transportation, we will not hit any of those targets. And while you showed the graph on transportation nationally, I will say that in all of the international discussions that I am in, especially with some of the member states in the EU and our Canadian partners, what we are seeing is transportation continues to be the largest source of emissions everywhere. And so it's not just about California addressing transportation or the US, there are many parts of the industrialized world, the Western countries that need to look at transportation and Europe is starting to do that. We're starting to see fuels policies, carbon pricing on transportation, expansion of their ETS. And so it's taken a while, but we're finally getting there where everybody is starting to see transportation as an area of interest and a key path to hitting our, our climate goals. So Rajinder, what would be um, really our biggest challenge in addressing that issue and, and the issue of transportation emissions? And what is the role of public money doing that? Sure. Sure, so there's two parts to transportation, right? There's going to be the technologies, there's the fuels, so that's you know the mechanical side of it. And there's a consumer side of it, the, the way that society thinks about how it moves, how it gets to school when this, back, when this pandemic is over, and how we think about the things that we enjoy like traveling to run errands or running other kinds of uh, trips for vacations. And so there's, there's gotta be efforts on both sides. There has to be a civil society component where we feel comfortable giving up all of our cars all of the time, which also helps on VMT, and being comfortable with things like ride share, once there is a vaccine, obviously, and being comfortable with public transit and investing in public transit. But then also, we can't just put clean fuels out there without clean technology to use those fuels. And in that respect, we at ARB have two lead programs. We have cap and trade, which is bringing in dollars from our auctions to invest through our low carbon transportation programs to fund clean trucks, rebates on light duty vehicles to make sure the technology is affordable and accessible for the people that are gonna rely on it. And then we have a low carbon fuel standard, which is turning over our fuel mix to make sure that low carbon fuels are available to meet the demand of that technology that we're putting out there. Um, and in all of this, all of those are a challenge. We need to do all of these and do it faster if we are gonna have any hope of avoiding the worst impacts of climate change. When it comes to public money, we as government, and, and this is not gonna be a surprise, we have limited resources as government, but we do have energy companies, we have utilities, we have oil companies. These companies have assets that are sitting out there that have traditionally moved fossil fuels around the system. And we are starting to see some of these uh, companies think about converting those assets into renewable fuel production. So we've got refineries at, I think it's Marathon and then P66 that recently announced that they're going to be starting to uh, produce biodiesel and that will help supply low carbon fuels into the economy. And it's those kinds of signals that the public um, side can send in terms of our market share, what we desire as consumers, what we value as consumers, government in terms of policies on signals on what we value as low carbon fuels, and then private company in terms of assets that can be transitioned over. There really is no one single challenge. It has to be all of these together. Well, if we had a ballot measure that would raise $30 billion or so that, um, that Nick mentioned, um, how do you think it might best be spent? Well, I think it's... Right, so there's there's multiple ways that I think that kind of money can be spent. Uh, first, we need to make sure that the technology, the low carbon transportation programs that we have at the state level that fund that technology penetration, make it easy for small truck fleet owners to get clean trucks or low income households to get light, light duty vehicles. The, that has to be there. We need to make sure that people are able to access and purchase that and use it. Uh, and that's where you're gonna see the emission reductions. Um, at the same time, that money can be invested in infrastructure. So for better or worse, what we are looking at right now is we are coming out of a pandemic, hopefully in the next few months. We're also coming out of an economic downturn because of the pandemic. We have an opportunity to marry up our economic recovery and come back better, or as the Biden administration says, build back better. And we have an opportunity to think about what we value. 
and how to invest the dollars in a way that um, supports where we want to go, not where we were before the pandemic. Um, and in doing that, not only do we create the demand, the market, the infrastructure to support the new transportation world that we want to see, but when you send that signal to manufacturers, manufacturers are going to start changing what they're putting into the marketplace. And as they ramp up production to meet California's demands for clean vehicles clean and, and clean fuels, it brings down costs for everyone that comes in after us. We know, looking at our Renewable Portfolio Standard Program, our policies on clean electricity brought down uh, costs for wind and solar. Other states that are coming in get to benefit from lower costs for getting that clean, clean energy. And California's market demand can pull all of that in and again, help bring down costs for other parts of the US. Well, so maybe other parts of the world as well? Yes, absolutely. I mean, manufacturers don't wanna make different products for different regions. Um, to the extent that they can be more efficient, I think they would all value that. So when we say um, when California leads, the world will follow, do you think there's truth there? Yes, we are the world's fifth largest economy. We are a, you know, we are a sub-national region and we are competing on a national stage in terms of our, our values and our market power. And in all the conversations that I know that many of us have, internationally and even across the US, people look to California as the gold standard on air quality, on greenhouse gases, on technology, clean, clean tech and programs to actually incentivize all of that to happen and be realized on the ground. So yes, I do think that if California leads, people do follow. Okay, great. So time to move on. I think Thank we're gonna see another slide here for a moment, aren't we? All right, so um, California has been leading in this effort for a long time, but some of you I'm sure have heard of some really very important uh, new actions taken by California to move this leadership even to a more progressive uh, direction. Governor Newsom has issued executive orders that require all light duty cars and trucks be zero emission, all sales be zero emission by 2035. He's also issued uh, in that same executive order that medium and heavy duty vehicles must be 100% zero emission by 2045 or feasible. Now, I don't think that's a sales target as much as it is a target for the universe of operating uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. It's also um, important that that same executive order included off-road vehicles, which is about half of the uh, diesel emissions in Southern California. CARB, California Air Resources Board, actually adopted an advanced clean truck rule, um, setting standards for manufacturers to begin in 2024, bringing zero emission trucks to the market. Um, and you can see here that 75% of all medium and heavy duty vehicles will be uh, zero emissions, sales will be zero emissions by 2035. I think that's a very, very um, smart move. And it really adds, I think, additional power um, to any effort to provide on the market side incentives. So we're gonna, I think, shift now to talking to uh, um, Steve Cliff and, uh, and my friend, Nick Josefowitz is gonna take over. Thanks, Danny. Um, hey, Steve, how you doing? Thanks so much for joining. Good morning. Um, Steve. Steve is, uh, is the Deputy Executive Officer at the California Air Resources Board. And he, one of his very, very important jobs is he's in charge of the mobile source program at CARB. So he's literally in the driver's seat as we drive towards a clean transportation future. I've been waiting 20 minutes to make that, to make that, to, to make that pun. Um, so um, th there's, th we have programs in place already um, that fund the, um, the sort of the, the cleaning of our transportation sector. But um, I, I have friends who couldn't access their ZEV credits um, because they're, 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 we, we don't have enough money for them. And I was just wondering if you could just touch on what you think are some of the most effective programs that we're running now as a state that you think we could really supercharge with additional revenue to, to really hit our targets. 
Yeah, thanks. Great question. Well, I first just want to thank you for uh, setting up this discussion and uh, to Denny for the overview of the governor's executive order. Uh, we think that's very innovative, not only because it looks at light duty vehicles and, uh, you know, many jurisdictions have targets for moving passenger transportation to zero emissions. But what's really innovative here is the focus on heavy, medium and heavy duty, as well as off-road moving to zero emissions as quickly as possible. Uh, and for my colleague, Rajinder, who really laid out some of the imperatives, including the equity needs that we need to address in terms of uh, getting to zero emissions um, and ensuring that those benefits are seen most in communities that have uh, been disproportionately impacted by air pollution uh, and broader challenges uh, historically. So um, to, the, to the point about revenue, I mean, we do have a number of programs under the Clean, uh, clean Transportation Program umbrella that include incentives for uh, vehicle purchase as well as um, uh, buying down the initial cost in the medium and heavy duty space for clean technologies um, to pilot programs uh, for um, uh, other on and off road zero emission uh, type uh, work. So the, the revenue itself, no matter how um, substantial is something that we can tailor to building a market. And uh, we've been able to do that I think very successfully um, in the past with relatively small amounts of money, uh, more recently with the larger amounts that have um, come from the cap and trade program that Rajinder mentioned. And then of course, given the challenges this year, we're going to have to pivot and see what we can do with uh, potentially a much smaller budget uh, and what opportunities still exist there. <clears throat> when we've done that, we've focused on some pilot programs that is getting technologies out there leveraging private capital, leveraging whatever dollars can be put in from the state uh, and leveraging the technology developers to um, you know, put in uh, technology uh, to some extent at their own cost in order to get technologies out on the market and see how they work. They get the data, they learn something from that and then that can feed into broader incentive type programs. So everything from those types of uh, programs to the very mature clean vehicle rebate project, which provides incentives directly to consumers who want to purchase a passenger uh, uh, car or truck um, that is uh, plug-in hybrid or zero emissions um, to essentially offset some of that initial cost uh, that, that, uh, that they see from um, this technology when they first purchase it. The thing that I, I want to say something just quickly that I think is very important is over the long haul, these technologies are, um, are cost effective. We're seeing data today that shows that uh, lower fueling costs and lower operating costs from, uh, from you know, it's a, it's a simpler technology in many ways. So the, the ongoing technology costs are lower, uh, actually help uh, uh, make the economic case for individuals or for companies to be purchasing zero emissions. What's really important is to ensure that that initial cost, which is higher, is offset, as well as the infrastructure development. And so those are two areas where I think the government can help a lot in ensuring that uh, we build a market, in addition to regulatory mandates that we're already putting in place. So you, I mean, I, I think this is a real theme that is that, that that I think a lot of us are focused on is is how can we accelerate that transition to where this becomes the clean transportation becomes the norm, and not something that we need to be kind of you know really shifting people towards proactively. Do you, I mean, just to kind of be to, to sort of go a little bit deeper, you see, there's a real we we, we can either go on that path slowly we can go on that path a lot faster. And, um, and it feels like, I mean, would you, how would you see the role of kind of major investments over the next 10 years? Do you see there's a real role for accelerating that transition to where this is the, the new normal and we don't have to be investing huge amounts of resources in, in, uh, in cleaning up our transportation system because that's just what it is? Absolutely. I think the goal here is to build a sustainable market. So starting with kind of larger uh, investment today, and then ultimately moving towards um, smaller or no investment in the future is an appropriate method. 
what research has shown is that it's not only the economic case that needs to be made, but it's the knowledge and um, development of a market based on consumer understanding of technology. And so what's important is by really making that push early, then you create a market because you create interest and uh, the technology uh, development happens more quickly and the market responds um, because there's knowledge of the availability and benefits of the, of the technology. So that earlier investment and larger scale in the beginning actually helps reduce the overall investment that's necessary. So I think it is imperative to have more investment today when we know that the technology has been developed, there's good engineering behind it, there's interest in the market, but it really requires that kind of jumpstart to get things going. And the sooner the better and uh, with regard to, to how quickly we can uh, get these introductions to happen. And so last question, um, you know, there's, how do you, could you maybe talk a little bit more about the, the sort of the, the interaction between regulation and kind of funding? Uh, it, it's, it's pr I think it's pretty clear that we can't just regulate our way out of this in the time scale that we that we need for some of the reasons that you and Rajinda have brought up around, especially around equity issues. But could you just kind of sort of help, help us understand how those things really complement each other, funding and regulation? Absolutely. I think it depends a little on the market that we're talking about. Uh, regulation for individual buyers of passenger cars and trucks uh, is not going to be a, a winning method. It's neither politically palatable nor is it possible, frankly, to regulate, um, you know, uh, 26 million individual vehicles, uh, you know, among uh, potentially 40 million Californians who might be interested ultimately in this technology. So um, that's just not a winning combination. Uh, even if the economics is there, really what you're trying to do is spur introduction of the technology, get a knowledge of its benefits and ensure that those benefits are realized by all of the, um, all of the market and especially those who have been marginalized in order to really get the technology out there. On the medium and heavy duty side, the commercial space, I think things are a little bit different in part because the economics is a much larger driver. And there, the regulatory efforts can go hand in hand. We currently have manufacturer mandates to ensure that manufacturers are actually producing and selling zero emission trucks that's the advanced clean trucks regulation that the California Air Resources Board recently adopted. And as well, we're developing a companion regulation, the advanced clean fleets, which is looking for those opportunities to transition to zero emissions as quickly as possible for uh, fleets where that technology is a good fit. And um, regulations can be following and kind of nudge where it's, we see it already happening here. We're gonna incentivize it early with funding, but, you know, bring a regulation on to kind of bring, you know, those who are maybe slow to, to take advantage of, of, the, uh, of the new technology. And then uh, in the long term, when uh, funding is really no longer appropriate, but there's kind of a, a relatively sustainable market, that's where you can bring in the rest of the market through regulatory efforts to ensure that you don't have any backsliding, that you uh, continue that investment and ensure that there's a market for those manufacturers who are essentially forced to build and sell those vehicles. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. Um, we're all fanboys of, of air regulators here. Um, so uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna move on to, to looking a little bit sort of from the state level down to the kind of air basin level. Um, I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna share a slide here um, for uh, and 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 pass it over to uh, to Denny. All right. So I want you to know, folks, that when I see this slide, I get very excited because it's so hopeful to me to see uh, the information that's provided here. This is um, an effort, an early draft effort from the South Coast. Air District, when they were trying to assess exactly how they would spend $65 billion over three decades to advance, accelerate clean technology. 
Um, and I've reorganized this slide. So it isn't exactly the slide that they put out. Reorganized it so that those zeros up there at the top that you see are kind of clustered at the top. What those zeros mean, that's the time that their district estimated we would no longer need to provide any kind of subsidies or incentives in the marketplace because technology in question would have become competitive, cost competitive, conventional fuels already. And what's exciting about this slide to me is how relatively quickly so many categories of vehicle go to zero. No need for subsidy because they are, um, they are now able to compete without subsidy in the marketplace. We regulate with the manufacturers, but we need to provide incentives in the marketplace. All right, so when you look at these categories, four on the, the five categories on the left, these categories dominate our emissions. They are overwhelmingly um, the source of our primary emissions. And when you look at those categories, you can see virtually all of them, except maybe off-road equipment, can become self-sufficient um, really in the marketplace in fairly short order. Now, this was all done before, um, this was all done before the advanced clean truck rule was adopted. So my guess is that with the incentive programs that our ballot measure idea could provide, these things in the trucks and the off-road equipment could also be accelerated, maybe even that 2035 target, in which case we would really have done a great deal um, to move clean air uh, to a reality and to help um, fight climate change. And that's especially important when you realize that all of the manufacturers of these technologies not only market all over the nation, market all over the world. What California does here, it does for the world. I want to introduce uh, Matt Miyasato, who is the Chief Technologist um, and the Deputy Executive Officer for Science and Technology at the South Coast Air District, really one of the most important agencies in the world for driving forward clean technologies, both cleaning our air and uh, fighting climate change. I, I have a couple of questions though, but Matt, um, First of all, when we look at that inventory, it really is evident that diesel technologies are the dominant concern from an air quality point of view. It's also a very important concern from a climate point of view. And what are we doing to move that system, that sector, to as clean a possible technologies as possible? And frankly, how close are, do we to, are we to success? Yeah, thank you for the introduction, Denny. Um, yeah, I'm not sure Steve, Dr. Steve Cliff would agree that we're the most innovative and <laughs> advanced uh, agency, but we certainly are the largest air district in the nation. And we also like to think of ourselves as the most innovative in pushing clean technologies, but that's with help uh, from our sister larger agency at the Air Resources Board. Uh, I wanna thank Spur and Move On for inviting the South Coast to participate. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that this topic is coming up, Denny, because as you mentioned, the South Coast, we are under pretty severe deadlines to bring our region into attainment with the federal standards. Now, just to remind folks, we are the, you know, the greater Los Angeles region, so about 44% of the state's population resides in the greater LA or South Coast basin. We have the two largest ports, LA and Long Beach, you know, 40% of all the containerized goods that come in the United States come through our region. So our communities are disproportionately impacted by all of the emissions that are associated with goods movement. And as Denny, you pointed out in that first bar chart, the NOx emissions that are responsible for our smog problem are mostly due to heavy duty, you know, typically the conventional diesel technologies associated with goods movement. So on-road heavy duty, off-road, if you dig deeper, it's marine vessels and locomotives. Um, but to answer your question, with respect to on-road heavy duty trucks, we've been really focused on how do we clean up the that sector in the time frame that we're given. So we, as I mentioned, we have federal deadlines. 2031, we've got to reduce emissions over 50% uh, from all sectors to get into federal compliance, which means we have clean air for everybody in the basin. Uh, and so we've been really pushing to accelerate the fleet turnover. And as was mentioned in the previous, um, uh, session with uh, Steve about, you know, how do regulations and incentives work hand in hand? Uh, what we've been doing at the South Coast is not only developing commercializing cleaner technologies, 
So that is uh, what we've done is developed a near zero, 90% cleaner natural gas engine for heavy duty trucks, as well as zero emission truck technology. And we're working with the state air board to, to really pilot these projects and develop those. Um, and so we're really pushing to develop a commercial technology that can be produced and, and adopted at scale. However, once it's developed, you've got to incentivize it as Cliff mentioned, or Steve mentioned rather, uh, to ensure that the marketplace adopts these technologies and implements it. And as I mentioned, we have very looming deadlines. And so we've got to accelerate that turnover. So it's really twofold, Denny. You've got to have the technology available. And then you have to incentivize it to ensure that that fleet turnover takes place. And we're doing it on two different fronts. One with a, you know, you can use renewable natural gas to have a near zero, 90% cleaner option now. And then as the zero emission technology is developed and commercialized, you uh, incentivize that. It's just the, the sad fact is all of the regulatory efforts that the Airbnb is conducting with the omnibus rule, the, uh, the ACT, advanced clean truck, and the fleet rules, it's not going to help us in the near term to get to the emission reductions that are necessary. Well, so Matt, we all know, I think, that the light duty vehicle, that there are a plethora of product now coming to market from all, actually all the manufacturers on the light duty side still need some incentives for them to build to the scale we need, right? But what's the status then of the trucking technology? Are we getting to zero emission trucks? And how soon do we think we can begin to get that into the marketplace on scale? Yeah, I, I, I guess the good news is, well, let, let me preface it by saying, you know, no, no one wants to see zero emission truck technologies in, uh, more than the South Coast. You know, we we have this historic smog problem. We know that the, the main culprit is on-road heavy duty trucks. And so we've been pushing for over a decade to develop a, a zero emission truck technology involving both fuel cells and batteries. Um, but in the interim, we, you know, if we get a 90% cleaner truck, that's, you know, that, that solves a, a big portion of our smog problem. And so we've, we've helped develop and commercialize that technology. So, you know, we're working on many fronts to develop the cleanest available technologies. And what's available currently is a commercial natural gas, heavy duty engine that, you know, there's over 200 trucks that are now running in and around the ports to reduce emissions. And we're working to develop zero emission truck technologies with all the major manufacturers, most notably Volvo and Daimler trucks. Those are, you know, that's number two and number one in the world, uh, uh, truck manufacturers. Um, so that we can get to the scale that's necessary. So we're really pushing, but those the zero emission technologies aren't yet commercially available. Um, and they probably won't be for another year or two, and even then at smaller scale, and we need 200 to 400,000 trucks to be replaced. So, you know, we, we've got to tackle the, the emissions problem on two fronts. And let me just say, if you do it correctly, you can solve the air pollution problem and the climate change problem if you do, you know, renewable natural gas on one hand, but also uh, zero emission uh, electric trucks uh, running off our renewable grid or, you know, renewable hydrogen with fuel cells. So what would, what would be the precise role of money that a ballot measure uh, might generate, um, do you think, for really accelerating those zero emission clean technologies? Yeah, unfortunately, I think as Nick and, and Steve had mentioned in the previous discussion is we just cannot, we don't have the luxury of time to regulate ourselves out of this issue. We have a, a, an urgency, which is, which is really health-based to replace these heavy duty, dirty diesel trucks in the near term before 2031. Um, and you know, to get to the climate change, the existential threat that we face by 2030, uh, 35, 2040, we've got to start now. So, um, we have to incentivize fleet turnover. There's just not enough time uh, to regulate it and change the marketplace uh, using a stick. We've got to use the carrot as well. So having a additional funding source uh, would be hugely uh, beneficial. And we know that it works because of our decades of experience with the Carl Moyer program, if folks are familiar with that, um, where we incentivize the incremental cost for cleaner technologies. We know it works. We just need to put that on steroids. Very good. So, um, so you sound like you've got some ground, you see some grounds for optimism then if we have a significant um, uh, load of money, as Mary Nichols say, shortly, yes, you're optimistic? Yes, absolutely. We have the history and the experience to know how to, to develop and implement uh, incentive programs, and we know that it works, yes. 
Well, so now I think I'm gonna go back to Nick, who's gonna have a conversation with um, Henry Hilkin from the Bay Area. Thank you, Denny. Hi, Henry. Um, uh, if you wanna take, if you wanna, there yeah, we go. I'm with you, I got Henry, you. Henry Hilkin is the Director of Planning and Climate Protection at the oldest air district in the country, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, also the air district which, whose job it is to make sure that my kids breathe clean air. So thanks, uh, thanks for doing that, Henry. Um, yeah. Thanks for being with us. Happy to, thank you for having me. Um, so we just talked a little bit about, you know, for, about sort of the challenges that the South Coast Air District faces around kind of clean air um, and, 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 and meeting climate targets. I, I was just wondering if you could kind of give the perspective from the Bay Area um, um, obviously, is sort of a, a hugely important area in the state as well. Are we, do we? Is it the same kind of challenge around kind of diesel emissions, um, primarily driving bad air, sort of air quality challenges in the Bay Area? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of similarities and a few differences. Um, certainly, sort of the overall. We saw some charts earlier of emission sources for statewide and in the South Coast, and the Bay Area is generally similar. Um, transportation is by far the largest source of, of air pollutants and greenhouse gases uh, in the Bay Area. There are slight differences between the regions, but transportation is, is the linchpin in meeting our air quality goals and climate goals. Um, we're, we're in a little bit better shape with respect to regional air pollutants. So um, South Coast is having, you know, has some great challenges meeting their uh, national ambient air quality standards for ozone and fine particulate. We're in a little bit better shape in the Bay Area. We actually have, um, uh, we, we have an attainment record for PM. We haven't been redesignated yet, but we're pre doing pretty well for fine particulates, not counting the wildfires. I wanna put the wildfires aside for a second. And ozone, we expect to attain the ambient air quality standards within a few years. So we certainly need those regional improvements to, to continue. Um, as Matt was discussing in, in Southern California. But I think for us, really, a lot of our focus is much more at the local level, um, the disproportionately impacted communities. And Rajinder talked about this a little bit in her, her remarks, that sort of historic uh, land use practices and lending practices and so forth that have um, resulted in our uh, communities of color and low-income communities being right next to goods movement, to mm -hmm. industry, to freeways. And so, um, and this is nothing new. We, we haven't made this up. I mean, the state yeah. has implemented programs to, to um, uh, direct us to look at, at a more local level. So that's really where a lot of our focus is in localized impacts. And diesel is, is by far um, the, the main culprit there. And you, know, you have really powerful programs going in sort of West Oakland and Richmond and, and those and, and communities like that. I mean, do you, do you feel that you, you have like with more funding, you could scale up those programs to look at so many of the other frontline communities that are primary that have been disproportionately impacted and are currently being disproportionately impacted by kind of diesel air pollution. Um, or, and, or do you think that there's a way of kind of getting that with, in a more, with, with just regulation? No, I think previous, I think the um, Steve and Matt, I, I completely agree with their comments. I mean, it really takes both. I mean, the regulation is, is look, the Air District is a regulatory agency. So that's, that's what we do um, on stationary sources. So obviously, I believe regulation is a huge, hugely important. But um, as Matt was pointing out, the, the, the rate of change that we need to see really uh, means that we need to use all the tools in the toolbox. So um, using incentives to accelerate that fleet turnover and development of those new technologies is, is critical. It's absolutely critical. Um, so, it, but it will take, um, you know, so it's not just funding the technologies and the fuels, but I think, um, and you and I have talked about this before, Nick, I, one item I want to surface in this conversation is not just looking at um, vehicle technology and the fuels uh, or the power source for those vehicles, but also on our behavior. And Rajinder also talked about this a little bit. You know, we have to, um, part of our transportation strategy in the Bay Area is not just, we certainly we want to accelerate cleaner fuels and cleaner vehicles, but it's absolutely critical to reduce vehicle use. We have to, to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Um, and that's, so I, I hope as, as this conversation continues and this funding measure 
um, proceeds. Um, I'd like us all to be thinking about that sort of not just technology, but what sort of programs and incentives can be included to um, to support local governments to revisit their land use decision making, um, mm -hmm. to provide incentive to you know to to support active transportation and transit when we start getting through the COVID challenges. Um, you know, getting people back on transit and working on safe routes to school and safe routes to transit programs. So I think, um, yes, the money is needed to uh, for incentives to support regulation, but I also want us to be very mindful of our behavior and um, looking at the vehicle miles travel um, challenges that that are very severe in California. We're getting we get the, the there's a bunch of people in the chat who are talking about e-bikes, for instance, as uh, as something that's a sort of an important complement to electrifying transportation, um, and uh, and you certainly can't regulate people into e-bikes, um, and uh, and so I, I you know do you feel that there's a that there's a real um, there's 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 a sort of a funding need as well around kind of some of the um, some of the most high impact ways of, of reducing vehicle miles traveled as well, wouldn't you say, Henry? Sure. I mean, cycling is the cleanest form of transportation. Um, so e-bikes are good old fashioned regular bikes. Absolutely. So, I mean, we like, you know, Matt talked about some of the incentive programs in South Coast. We have similar programs up here and we fund all sorts of um, bike routes and bike uh, facilities. So whether it's supporting e-bikes or just good old fashioned regular bikes to provide that infrastructure um, is, is really critical. And I think one of the things we've seen during the COVID challenges we've been having is, is a lot of cities are experimenting with open street programs. A lot of cities around the Bay Area are um, closing off streets and, and encouraging people to get out and walk and cycle and skate more. And I see a lot of kids doing it. And to me, that's a really hopeful sign um, when I walk down the street or up to the BART station near me, I see kids learning to ride their bikes in a BART lot. Um, that's thrilling to me. So if we can support that through these funding programs, that that's something we need to do. Yeah, it's really the, the sort of the potential for sort of creating that market transformation around these sort of e-bikes, which as much as some of us might love them are sort of fairly niche now and being able to kind of build the scale to drive down the cost, I think is is really, really is, is, is sort of, you know, something that we're looking to do across all of sort of clean transportation with this measure. Um, thank you so much, Henry, for, for joining and, and bringing this perspective. We're gonna, we're gonna switch over back to Denny. It's kind of like ping pong here between the Bay Area and, uh, and LA. Um, and, uh, and so, Denny. I, isn't that been the case for a long time? So I'm going to be talking with John Bozell um, now about CalStart. John, you're the CEO of CalStart. Tell us a little bit about CalStart, but mostly I want to hear uh, what's really exciting um, on the new technology front and the prospects for really marketing the most advanced technologies, whether they're zero emission battery or hydrogen uh, technologies out there. Give us a lowdown of what we got to be excited about and why we should be optimistic that indeed we can roll out this clean fleet of heavy duty and off-road vehicles as well as cars in a timely way. Great, Denny, uh, really happy to be here today. And Denny, I can answer the questions. I don't know if we can access those slides or not, but happy just Noah to go ahead and- put the slides up here, Noah. Uh, but happy just to go ahead and answer the question. So uh, first of all, Cal what is CalStart? We're an industry, association. We have 260 member companies uh, that are all focused on clean transportation technologies. So our, our members range from a new startup down in Torrance, California called Canoe, that is uh, building an electric car, uh, to Ford, to Tesla, to uh, Freightliner, UPS, etc. So we have a, a great, great, huge number of companies that we're working with. I think one thing that hasn't been hammered home enough here today is the economic opportunity for the state of California. Since we launched uh, over 28 years ago, we've really built the industry here in California. California's policies and investment have attracted companies. We now have 60,000 direct jobs in the state related to the clean transportation industry. There are more electric vehicles built in the state of California than in any other state. 
There are more electric buses built in California than in any other state. And this was a state that a lot of other people are, were saying, too costly, too expensive, you can't build things. We are, our members are building vehicles here. We're building components. We're building clean fuel, producing clean fuels. And so there is a huge economic opportunity. That's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this investment opportunity that you're talking about. With this investment, we can really grow this industry and create more jobs. So that's hugely excited. Then maybe let's just go to the next slide because you also asked about the commercial vehicle sector. And we, our organization, one of the things we do is we manage for California Air Resources Board, it's a program called HVIP, which is the incentive program for zero emission trucks and buses. Um, and what we did about three years ago was a market study for, for CAR. How do we get to zero emissions in the commercial vehicle market? And what we did was we did an exhaustive analysis. The commercial vehicle market is really fragmented, all these different kinds of trucks and buses. But a large number of them, probably about 40%, uh, operate less than 200 miles a day and return to base to the same depot each night. That really makes them ideal for today's technology to go to zero emission. So you can see on the far left there, buses, forklifts, delivery vehicles, yard tractors, and as we move to the middle, medium-sized freight regional haul. All those first four ways by 2022, we can get to zero emission. So the state has got a regulation in place to do that. That technology is improving. It's where we're seeing great product come to the market. Battery costs have come down by 90% over the last 10 years. And they were going to see a similar curve over the next 10 years. And I think by 2025, 2027, we'll see cost parity uh, and, and zero emission vehicles will be very competitive. The only issue will be the upfront costs remain high. The total cost of operation uh, will overall be beneficial, but particularly for small fleets, uh, which represent the vast majority of trucking companies in California, they need that upfront capital to help purchase these trucks. So uh, that's why this funding you're talking about is so important. And I wanna just say that it's a zero emission. We should be pushing zero emission as much as we can with new vehicles, but we've gotta realize that we're only, even by 2030, if we're lucky, we'll be able to get to 50% of new trucks sold would be zero emission. So that means more than half the vehicles sold, trucks sold this decade will be, still be internal combustion engine vehicles. So we want them to be as clean as possible use the best available technology, and we want them running on clean fuels like renewable natural gas, biodiesel, and renewable diesel. So let's talk for a minute, John, about, um, I, know, I know you have another slide. Do you want to go to that other slide first, but I have a question. Well, yeah, maybe, Denny, just one other really key point is when you look at this slide, is these are the vehicles that they don't operate in Marin County much or Beverly Hills. Uh, these are vehicles that most impact disadvantaged communities. They operate around distribution centers, ports, et cetera. So the state's program, uh, HVIP program, and another one called Clean Off-Road Vehicle Equipment, 60 to 70% of those vehicles deployed, incentivized by the state, get deployed in disadvantaged communities. So if we clean up these vehicles, we're going to provide the biggest benefit for disadvantaged communities because that's where the truck traffic and the buses are, are operating the most. So there's a huge benefit here for those, for those communities if we clean up this sector. Great, great. So um, let's talk for a minute about long haul trucking though. You know, long haul trucking is about one eighth of all the trucks in Southern California, but they're about one fourth of the vehicle miles traveled. And I'm told they're about half of the diesel emissions. We're not gonna get the clean air unless we do something with long haul trucking. These trucks go out of state, go all over the nation, zigzag, they don't even necessarily know where they're gonna go when they leave, except maybe the first two destinations, right? They can be gone for 13, 14, 15, 16 days before they return. How do we deal with the long haul trucking challenge? Um, is that a one fuel? Is electric zero emission gonna be the one? Is it a hydrogen fuel? Is it both? What are we, what are we gonna do make that succeed, we have to if we're going to win this race to zero. 
Yeah. So, Denny, that's a good question, and and I, I get that quite often. What's really important is here is that that slide I showed with all the waves. We start nailing those niches. What we do is we start to build to the economies of scale. Uh, we see a supply chain develop, and then all of a sudden, then it becomes a lot easier to tackle that long haul market because costs start coming down and uh, we have an industrial base ready to support that. So uh, the state of the trucking industry is changing dramatically with e-commerce. We're seeing a lot of uh, shorter haul uh, and I think we'll be able to see electric trucks serve a lot of that medium to longer haul. I also think we're gonna see fuel cell trucks come on big time as well. Uh, I do wanna echo what Matt Miyasato was talking about you know, near term are really clean, ultra low NOx uh, trucks powered by natural gas, hopefully by renewable natural gas. That is also a really good near term solution. I see. So if we don't have the zero, we have to use something else or else we're going to default to diesel. Yeah. And, and but I am super optimistic about where the technology is headed and the possibilities here. One other category I would have added on to Matt's chart and is uh, when we think about disadvantaged communities or as a program we're running uh, with the state of California with CARB called Clean Mobility Options. And that program is specifically designed not to just reduce emissions in disadvantaged communities, but to provide better mobility for people living in disadvantaged communities. So through that program, and it's, it, we've now, it's been fully subscribed through applications, Awards will be announced early next uh, year for the first round of funding. But there will be opportunities to fund micro transit, uh, micro mobility, and electric bike sharing and electric car sharing in disadvantaged communities. So through that program, we're gonna be bringing better mobility options, zero mobility options to disadvantaged communities. So I'd like to see some of that funding set aside for those kind of programs that not only help address the equity issue from emissions, but then also help provide better mobility as well. Well, you'll certainly see support from that from I think uh, Spur and Move California as well. So I've heard that you use and others use the expression economies of scale here. Sounds like economies of scale is the secret sauce to success here that we've got to use. We've got regulations driving the manufacturing and then we've got incentives to help drive the market and get the manufacturing manufacturers producing enough technology so that we reach economies of scale and the costs come down and are competitive with the conventional technology. That, uh, is that the formula we're trying to hit here? It, 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 really, it really is, Danny, and, I, and I'm super optimistic. And, and by the way, that uh, wave chart I showed with those segments, uh, we now have a global program. So we're actually working with other nations now trying to get them to focus on those same targets, same segments, so that we can get to truly global economies of scale. So if California leads, the world will follow. And now back, it'll follow us back to Nick. <laughs> and then Nick. Danny, thank you, John. Um, now we're gonna be talking, um, that, was, that was great. Um, now we're gonna be talking to Dawn Wilson, the former Director of Environmental Affairs and Sustainability at Southern California Edison. Dawn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And, and thank you also for being such a regular participant and on, on Move LA panels um, in the past. So one of Southern California Edison's roles, in addition to promoting zero emissions electric vehicle technologies and obviously a lot of other things, is, is to ensure that the charging infrastructure is available for electric vehicles. Tell us a little bit more about sort of where we're at with that. Um, and, and what we need to make more progress, especially in low income and frontline communities, which it's so easy to kind of um, not invest in sufficiently. Sure, sure. So first of all, it's great to be able to participate in this um, really important discussion and promoting um, zero emission vehicles and ensuring the availability of charging infrastructure is really one of the cornerstones of um, my former employer's um, vision about a clean energy future. And 
uh, about a year ago, there was a paper, a white paper that was issued focusing on um, Pathways 2045 and a, um, it was really focused on carbon neutrality. And the three elements of this were really about decarbonizing the um, electricity and then electrifying transportation and buildings. And really when you stop and think about it, this is really a very natural role for utilities because utilities are in the business of managing large networks of infrastructure. So Edison specifically has a number of programs, one of which is uh, the Charge Ready program, which is focused on light duty vehicles. It started back in 2017 when there was um, a pilot program that was very quickly oversubscribed. And um, the whole purpose of this program is to facilitate the installation and ownership as well as maintenance of the charging infrastructure um, up to the actual charging station, which is owned by the customer. And there are potential rebates um, for the full cost of the charging station for qualified customers. Um, an interesting note, we were initially required in the pilot to have about 10% of the installations be in disadvantaged communities. And it actually happened through the pilot that there were over 50% uh, installed in the uh, disadvantaged communities. So now where we are is um, the PUC just a few months ago, back in August, approved the California Public Utilities Commission, um, approved the full program, which ended up being um, a little less than a half of a billion dollar pro program and with the requirement that 50% of the installations be in disadvantaged communities. So, um, so that's one of the great programs. Another program we have is Charge Ready Transport, which is focused on medium and heavy duty um, and off-road vehicles. And that's about a $350 million program. So all of these programs I would wanna note have a market um, education and outreach element to them, which is critically mm -hmm. important. And then, um, so I think we are well on our way to making progress um, um, on that on that front. And how would you, so how would you say to, to that last point that you made, um, how would you say the progress that we're making compares to the need that we have? And, and are we getting there fast enough? No, no, absolutely not. And the, which is why this potential um, ballot initiative is so important because Although utilities have the experience and the expertise in terms of managing and the development of infrastructure, there's first there's limitations on what we do because we've been doing it individually. Each utility has its own separate um, regional area that they're responsible for. And what we ultimately have to do is make sure that we have at minimum a statewide um, integrated program that facilitates and sort of contemplates what this should look like, what the infrastructure should look like. We have to look at, at housing. We have to look at the, the housing's relationship to um, job centers. So there's a, a lot more we need to do in terms of our planning process, as well as additional funding. And can you talk a little bit about how vehicle uh, sort of is how, how sort of expanding the grid, expanding charging networks acts as sort of a, a, a job creator um, and, um, and especially the sort of the role that utilities like Southern California Edison play in kind of making sure that those good jobs are, are accessible to folks um, in frontline communities who, who've in a reparative way. Absolutely. All of this work, any infrastructure um, projects are in by definition job creators because you are building things. And so it really is a matter of um, making sure that we're having the appropriate training and um, outreach. I haven't even gotten onto the, um, the whole equity um, issues that are critically important here that have to be fully baked and integrated into this process and into this plan that I was referring to. That's critically important for this to, to move forward, but there are definitely um, significant um, job opportunities um, for, and we have to make sure and be mindful of just transition issues as well for, for labor to make sure that the jobs, that the new jobs that are coming in can be filled by the people whose jobs are going to be 
eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting the time is up response. I want to have another like 15 minutes of okay. conversation here, but, um, um, but Dawn, thank you so much. And, uh, and hopefully now that, um, are you in a little bit of retirement? Maybe we can benefit even more from all the time that you have to consider to, to, and your wisdom to, to be able to continue this conversation and, and draw on that. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us, Dawn. Thank you. Okay, Denny. Hey, Nick, we're going to talk now to Kevin Mackay from the Southern California Gas Company. Kevin, where are you? There you are. Sure. So, um, with the gas company, they sell natural gas, also renewable natural gas, RNG. Uh, they're working with that and with hydrogen. Um, make the case that RNG and hydrogen ought to be seen from an environmental point of view as a legitimate contender in the future. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Did that people Make the case for why RNG and hydrogen should be regarded as an environmental, as a contender for environmental uh, inclusion um, in oh. the future fleets. Okay, yeah, well, let me back up. I know that RNG can be, I see that there's 218 people on here, so maybe not all 218 understand uh, what, what RNG is exactly, I guess, it can because it can be a little confusing. And I guess as simply as I could put it, it's, it's when, uh, you capture methane from natural uses like dairies, landfills, wastewater treatment plants. You, you capture that, clean it up and, and use it, put it in the pipeline or use it in transportation. I think where it gets particularly confusing is uh, because it gets negative carbon intensity ratings uh, and people don't quite understand why. And uh, kind of simply put, it's it's not only are you displacing fossil fuels uh, like, like diesel, but you're also mitigating methane that would have otherwise been released into the atmosphere. So it's getting the lowest carbon intensity ratings in, in the low carbon fuel standard in the LCFS program. It's getting uh, up to minus 300, um, in, in, which is exciting. This is exciting to us. Um, what's equally exciting for, for RNG on the RNG front is that it, it, it's here today. According to the LCFS in quarter two, all of the compressed uh, RNG that's been reported in the LCFS system on average is has a negative carbon rating. Um, so it's and it's the most, the, it's a very important critical tool that we get emission reductions um, today. So I hope that that kind of explains it, but these sources of RNG are gonna to continue to be around for as long as there's human activity and we need a place to use that. And I think it's particularly for uh, RNG and transportation, RNG and hydrogen in the transportation side, I think um, if we wanna turn over the fleet from diesel to any alternative fuel, a portfolio approach is, is truly needed for a number of reasons. I mean, first off, over-reliance on one technology is, uh, can be problematic for in case something goes wrong. And anything can go wrong if you put all your eggs in one basket. But also the industry, they, need, they have different needs and need different options. Some operations go short distances, but many go long. Some operate a few hours a day, but some do three shifts a day. And I think that if we want to disrupt the, the transportation sector and really turn over diesel, one of the best ways to do it is to give users options. So in addition to, to users having different needs, the public, they have multiple needs. Uh, we're all in the emission reduction business for, for one, if not all of the three main reasons, which is public health, particularly in environmental justice communities, regional attainment, and to fight climate change. And as you look back at your action slide, and we support all of the, the executive orders and, and the regulations that are put out by CAR, but a lot of them are 2035 or 2045, which is great, but we need action today. Tell us about the potential of fuel cell trucks on the long haul applications. Um, we are, are, are very bullish on, on hydrogen. We think that it's a, a great fuel moving forward once the technology develops further. The, the advantages of it is that it's lighter weight, than, than battery electric, it's fast fuel, and it can go long distances. Uh, and there's hardly any, any downtime. I think one of the, the big changes if we were to, to change the you know, predominantly battery electric is that it fundamentally changes the, the fueling model for trucks. The trucking sector is built on this fast fuel diesel model, uh, which it would be very disruptive to switch you know, overnight, but hydrogen keeps that model so you can fuel go, keep going, you could slip seat, you could have different three different drivers through eight different eight hour shifts in a day. You could really utilize that truck to the bone 
if you wanted to. Cool. So I'm going to shift now to um, another member of our panel, Todd Campbell. Todd, where are you, Todd? There you are, Todd. Now you're with Clean Energy, and Clean Energy um, exclusively deals in California with RNG. Am I right? We do. Yeah, and so um, elaborate if you could about the potential for RNG, and I guess hydrogen is derived from or can be derived from RNG, and the potential for trucking industry in your view, especially this challenging long haul trucking industry. So, so thank you, Denny. Uh, you know, the, the potential for renewable natural gas, I think, is substantial, um, largely because, uh, you know, as we do more in-state renewable natural gas, the carbon intensity on average is starting to uh, be negative. Uh, in other words, uh, renewable natural gas is being supplied, particularly the, the compressed natural gas uh, form of RNG uh, is already delivering carbon negative values to fleets that are currently using it in the state of California, which is, is huge news and, and much needed uh, given, you know, the climate situation. Um, but, you know, I think the other thing that's really important that Kevin touched on and others did as well is, you know, we're in a really bad situation. Uh, you know, you, you combine the omnibus rule uh, which is, you know, installing uh, new low NOx uh, standards for engines uh, with the advanced clean truck rule. And by 2031 for the South Coast Air Basin, you're only going to get 11 tons roughly per day when we need 148 tons per day and trucks are the number one source of pollution. So, uh, you know, we need to be able to make sure that the 200,000 plus trucks that are pre-2010 that are high polluters that are going to be replaced because of the truck and bus rule by January 1, 2023, do have an opportunity to make a clean truck option as many have stated. Uh, and that could be hydrogen fuel, uh, hydrogen fuel cell, it could be battery electric, but I think for those drivers uh, that have very low incomes and don't make a lot of money, uh, it's probably more likely that they'll be more open to getting into a low NOx, uh, truck with a renewable fuel uh, to, to meet future standards. And, and so, you know, when I look at this uh, effort to bring more money to the table, when I know greenhouse gas reduction funds are, are already being reappropriated, uh, unfortunately, uh, to other uh, resources and, uh, you know, Prop 1B is almost done and Carl Moyer needs reauthorization and, and a lot of fixes, to be quite honest, to make that program work. Uh, this is exactly what the state needs. Uh, so it doesn't need to make tough choices. It doesn't need to just fund uh, future vehicles that may not be on our roads for another 10, 15, 20 years uh, substantially. Um, you know, but we can, we can do both. We can address what I think is really important. Uh, the disadvantaged communities that are being impacted right now by diesel pollution and, and not just a little, a lot. I mean, you know, being from uh, the environmental community originally from uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Coalition for Clean Air. Uh, I'm very familiar with many of the studies that have been done up and down the state and the toxicity and pollution levels for these communities are not only intolerable, uh, but they're, they're, they violate uh, what we, we deem as acceptable risk. So uh, I think that something like this would really be a huge infusion. It probably won't solve the problem because I am even doubtful, you know, Let's not forget we have a 2023 deadline, which is very important to disadvantaged communities that, that we have even talked about uh, for attainment, both for the South Coast and the San Joaquin. But uh, for 2031, I think it's gonna be a struggle too. Uh, and that's not good news for breathers. And, and it's all the more reason why, you know, John Bozell and others have said, so let's, let's have an infusion, a, a, a revolution that, that allows for us to create clean green jobs uh, but also let's be able to be in a position where we can support technologies that are available now and that also could support a transition to zero, even if that transition may take longer than we expect. Thank you very much, Todd. I think I'm going back to Nick here, who is going to uh, introduce our last two panelists. Thank you so much, Denny. Um, so, um, Susanna, Rays, um, if you want to, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if there, there we go. 
um, the national volunteer co-lead at the Sierra Club of the Clean Transportation for All campaign. And the Sierra Club has been fighting this fight for so successfully for so long. So thank you so much for joining us, Susanna. I'd love to just hear your kind of thoughts on the conversation we've had today um, as a way to kind of help, help kind of bring this conversation to a close and, and more generally on the need for this uh, a sort of, you know, more funding to, to ensure a kind of a, a sort of to, to, to get at some of the goals that we hit at at the top of the uh, of the agenda, including kind of climate justice and, and equity. So thank you so much for including me. And um, as I've been listening to the discussion, I want to, to put out there, I've been taking a lot of notes, um, some key insights um, from an environmental EJ and economic justice perspective. So clearly um, there is a need for huge funding, right? In the infrastructure and the transportation sector, um, because the, really there's an in, the investment gap is growing, especially in the underfunded communities and the debt need for funding is becoming more dire. Uh, there is a, you know, a strong appetite um, for investment. I think investors will be willing to do their share to mitigate the climate impacts and really do good. So there is the opportunity for this one to tap um, additional uh, inv investors as well. Um, the World Bank, uh, for example, has the green bonds that they use. Um, there are other kinds of different bonds like sustainability and sustainable development bonds. Locally, we have our community development block grant bonds to fund transportation um, projects. Um, the environment to achieve zero emissions is very supportive now. So there are commitments globally, nationally, and locally. We're going back uh, rejoining the Paris Agreement and the advocacy by our climate EJ activists are effectively changing policies. And the focus though must really be on programs that we believe will most quickly and aggressively uh, you know, create jobs, protect the health of our public, reduce climate pollution and scale up existing programs. Um, a major element is ensuring that these investments um, build out is done in a way that is equitable to all communities, uh, that they have access to these investments, for example, affordable charging, right? And that uh, making sure that it is also scalable. Um, we need to get our utilities um, prepared a grid for the harsh realities that of climate change. Um, and, we, and we talked about that uh, if we are going to aggressively increase adoption of uh, electrification of the transportation sector, then uh, we need to make sure that our, the electricity we generate from the grid is uh, come from renewables um, sources. Um, so uh, in essence, I mean, this real openness, you know, I, I love the proposal. There's so much, uh, a lot of thinking that is going out there. Uh, we need to be mindful about integration uh, as we are going to build this coalition, right? Across various mm -hmm. sectors, uh, they're critical. Mm -hmm. Transportation, finance, even urban planners, right? Community partners. We need to identify who are impacted by our actions, who's missing at the table, uh, if we are bringing together a sustainable coalition. And, you know, Susanna, you, you operate at the national scale, which is kind of, you know, beyond the focus of this measure, but how do you see something like this happening in California and having an impact across sort of beyond California? We are already leading the way. Um, California is leading the way in terms of our clean car standards, um, the adoption of electric vehicles, our focus on cleaning the ports um, with our heavy duty um, uh, trucks and, and, and vehicles. So locally, um, we, we are doing the work. And even in the city of Los Angeles itself, uh, we have been working with Metro to electrify their trucks. Um, there's a huge opportunity to electrify buses um, new business model where the utilities can get involved. Um, so th those um, projects that we have right now can be replicated. What's really needed if we have this proposal on hand and if we get the funding is to do a huge demonstration project that is at the scale of a city, for example, um, that could be a model um, for na nationally and globally. 
and you you're a commissioner on an at an LADWP i mean there's 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 willingness amongst kind of cities to step up and show how you can fully decarbonize um, the the transportation fleet i know san francisco has an incredibly aggressive ev strategy as well uh, definitely um, as a commissioner which I'm, I'm gonna wear that hat now. <laughs> um, uh, the, that the, the utility has, you know, um, multiple programs to decarbonize the grid uh, and ensure um, that um, the rates still are affordable and that the service and the and and that power is uh, reliable, right? Especially now that we're talking about the wildfire season heat storms that affect um, how, how, how we're responding. But there is also um, that huge um, inception of programs that we partner with locally with the mayor's office, the city of Los Angeles, the LA Department of Transportation, um, Metro in terms of electrification of the transportation sector um, and using also grants from CARB mm -hmm. Um, to ensure that we have, for example, a successful program that we have is the Blue LA electric car sharing for disadvantaged communities where really the, the voices and the ownership of that program are coming from those that have been affected by the climate burden, by the pollution burden. Um, so I really want to emphasize as well that if there is um, this pro program funding, to really take a look at micro transit and micro mobility projects, mm -hmm. um, which could help um, the communities at large and make it really community centered and community focused. But with the utility, I mean, yeah. we're working also with the port in electrifying the corridor for heavy duty trucks. It's the, the transition to electric vehicles provides an opportunity not just to clean up our transportation, but provide more mobility um, for uh, especially for low income and frontline communities. And it, I'm so glad that you that you centered that in, in this discussion. Um, thank you so much, Susanna. We got we got, we got only a few more minutes and we got um, I want to make sure we get to to Raj Dillon, the senior manager of advocacy and public policy at Breathe Southern California, formerly known as Breathe LA. Um, Raj, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us, you know, I'm sorry we don't have more time, but give us your, uh, give us, give us your hot take on what you just heard. Yeah, so hey everybody, Raj Dillon here with Breathe SoCal. Uh, we're an environmental health organization focused on improving air quality and improving lung health. And we heard a lot of discussion about uh, some, some potential solutions to this issue that we're dealing with, with regard to diesel, uh, diesel pollution, with regard to climate change. I just wanna mention a couple things if I could. Uh, number one, I think it's important to have both a short-term strategy and a long-term strategy. There are a lot of alternatives that we can, that we can utilize, but they're better suited for long-term solutions. Um, such as electric and perhaps even hydrogen. Uh, we're fuel neutral. Whatever we can do to eliminate diesel, that's what we need to. That's what we need to do, both in the short term and in the long term. And we have a lot of different uh, organizations, agencies that have the long-term goal of transitioning to zero emission, but not necessarily a roadmap of roadmap of how we're going to get there. And I think that's, that's what's really important. We need to instill confidence in the public that we're working on this issue and that they're seeing some more immediate benefits of, of, um, of this new technology and not having to wait until 2035, 2045 to see that, uh, to see that change. Um, and I wanna add, sorry, go ahead, Nick. I was gonna say, how do you, I mean, a bunch of our panelists sort of spoke about how funding can dramatically increase the take up of these new technologies compared to kind of just regulations on their own, which have to sort of lag a little bit from uh, in terms of the technological progress. Does that does that resonate with kind of with you and the communities that you work with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's when we're talking about funding. Um, so like we're here talking about potentially a ballot measure. Um, and I think that there are a couple different ways to kind of to kind of look at um, how California voters are reacting to potential tax increases. And so um, everyone wants to point to Prop 15 this past year, trying to raise a bunch of money for schools. Um, and some people will point to that and say, well, 
voters are fed up with new taxes, particularly in the middle uh, of a health crisis. But if we dig deeper and if we look at the local landscape, um, and shout out to George Skelton from the LA Times for, for putting this together, but um, local sales tax increases, uh, for example, were very successful this year. And so this doesn't suggest that voters are outright objecting to tax increases, but what it might imply is that there's a lack of confidence in politicians in Sacramento, in agencies and in organizations, and we need to do a better job of instilling that confidence uh, in the public that we're actually on their side and we're gonna do the things that we claim that we're going to do. And we, we do hear that from our local community um, when we're talking to, to, to stakeholders in our, um, in the diesel, uh, di the diesel death zone, for example, and these low income communities and communities of color. Um, the diesel death zone, I you've got to tell us more about that. Yeah, and, the, uh, the, it's just such a such a such a powerful phrase. And and how can we make it in? How can how can we re sort of repair? It, and and is this the type of thing that that could kind of turn the diesel death zone into a kind of an electric life zone? I don't know. I just yeah, there's a there's a big opportunity here. So the diesel death zone, basically, where you have a bunch of diesel trucks traveling. Um, traveling through um, such as the 710 corridor and and these uh, low income communities. And uh, we heard Matt talk about uh, incentivizing fleet turnover uh, earlier when he, when he was um, when he was talking. And I think that's that's a really important uh, aspect of this. Diesel pollution is a major problem now and we can't wait until 2035, 2045, all these years and decades later to actually you know, implement these changes that we want to see. We want to be able to breathe easier now, today, and not have to wait 10, 20, 30 years for that. And so it's important to have uh, solutions that we can implement now with a long-term view uh, and, and long-term uh, solutions such as electric and hydrogen. Um, well, I think, you know, the, the, the diesel death zone, I, you know, the, I, I hadn't heard that phrase before, but I think that's a good way yeah, to, to sort of start bringing us to a close. So Raj, thank you so much for joining us and for your comments. I think, Thanks for the, you know, the reason all of us are here to a certain extent is, is to make sure that we don't have diesel death zones. Um, and, and it's often said that there's no silver bullet to solving climate change, um, that, we need, that we need silver buckshot. Um, and, but even silver buckshot costs a hell of a lot of money. And, and that's, that's what we can do with this measure that we're, we're contemplating. Um, and so I, I just want to um, really, um, um, let me find the, the, the slide here. Um, I want to really, really thank our, our panelists um, for, uh, for joining us. We, we, it, it's the, for your wisdom and your insight and for all the work that you do day in and day out um, working on these issues. Um, thank you so much to, uh, to Rajinda, to Stephen, to Matt, to Henry, to John, to Dawn, to Kevin, to Todd, Susanna, and Raj. Um, I want to thank everybody on the Spur and Move LA team to organize today. Marissa, Livesey, Gloria, Eli, Noah, and Jeremy. Go to our website, climateandcleanair.org, um, where you can find out more, at Climate and Clean Air on Twitter, um, and email us. Um, and uh, if you, uh, if, with your insights, your wisdom, um, your, uh, your questions, um, this is the type of thing, the level of ambition that, 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 that we have for, uh, for, for getting to grips with climate change, to cleaning our air, to ensuring a just transition and, and repairing frontline communities. We can only do it if we do it together with, with all of you. So um, thank you for joining. Um, and, uh, um, and we're ending on time.